Alcohol on Our Lives was published on the 30th of July, and it's on a couple of websites which are set out there. And the purpose uh, of that paper is to do two things. It first of all tries to define the problem. And we try to bring all the research together in one place. And I must say the cumulative effect of it all does give you cause to pause about what is happening in our country. Designing a comprehensive package for dealing with this problem is a bit like walking along a tightrope. You can fall off at any time. Now, the reason why this is such a difficult area to reform and why rational policy may not necessarily get accepted is really self-evident. People like to drink. The important thing to remember, I think, about any reform program is that bills are made to pass and parliaments pay attention to what people want. And there will be quite a lot of resistance to the measures that we are recommending. I do want to confess to you, as Minister of Justice in 89, uh, 1989, I was responsible for the Sale of Liquor Act of that year and the design uh, effort that led to it. It was a highly liberalising uh, piece of legislation. It did bring some good features to New Zealand life, a cafe society that has flourished. But unfortunately, it did not change the drinking culture of New Zealand, uh, which, uh, as far as I can see, was inherited by the British, uh, from the British, and it's not a very attractive drinking culture. ALAC, who's well represented at this conference, defines binge drinking as a session in which a person consumes seven or more standard drinks, and one standard drink contains 10 grams of pure alcohol. ALAC's latest survey shows that 25% of adult drinkers in New Zealand can be categorised as binge drinkers. It is estimated that 44% of all alcohol available for consumption in New Zealand is consumed in heavier drinking sessions. We know that young people aged 14 to 19 are drinking more alcohol when they drink. Women's alcohol consumption has been increasing uh, over time across all ages, but particularly among young women. In the past, Māori have had higher rates of abstention than the rest of the population, but this is changing quickly. And those Māori who do drink have some serious problems. We are in the situation where drunkenness seems to me to be cool where people think it's fun, that they take pictures of each other's getting drunk and throwing up and put them on Facebook. Now, unless you can change by peer group pressure the need to say it is not cool to be drunk. There are about 14,000 outlets in New Zealand for 4.2 million people. If an applicant is suitable and has a valid resource management certificate, that's the planning law, a liquor licence is almost inevitable given the present legislative provisions. Local government in New Zealand is very, very concerned, in, particularly in many metropolitan areas, about the social damage that is occurring that they feel quite unable to do anything about. There must in New Zealand be wider grounds upon which a licence can be refused than we have at present. Uh, and that will be very controversial. The Liquor Licensing Authority has been a success within the range that it has power over. But the powers that it has, we think, are inadequate and they need to be extended. We are clear at this stage there is one thing that we must do. We must have a complete new act, not an amending act. The existing act has been amended 12 times and in New Zealand, because of the three-year electoral cycle, it is often much easier to amend a statute than do it all over again, and that leads to a lot of back and fill in the legislation that makes it hard to follow. This is legislation that has to be uh, not only understood by policemen, but by barmen, by publicans, by public health workers, and by a lot of other people, uh, and, and indeed it needs to be addressed in plain language and it needs to be accessible. I come to the question of ours. 
we are saying that the hours need to be restricted, that it would be a good idea if off licenses were restricted from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. and then closed so that you couldn't go back in the middle of the night and then drive away. On licenses, we suggest should close at 2 a.m., extending to 4 a.m. on a one-way door policy. We've got 24-hour drinking in parts of Auckland uh, now and in places like Queenstown. I might say that our team of eight working on this in the New Zealand Law Commission has been out on 17 occasions with the police in uh, 17 locations, on multiple occasions in fact, with the police all over New Zealand and we don't start those exercises until about 11 o'clock at night and by two in the morning it's not a pleasant sight. Alcohol crime and antisocial behaviour has been one of the big themes of our research. Of all the recorded criminal offending in 2007 and 8 uh, in New Zealand, at least 31% was committed by those who'd consumed alcohol beforehand, and we know that's a very conservative number. Over 20,000 violent offences were committed by an offender who'd consumed alcohol prior to the offence. Young males under 25 are most likely to be apprehended for these offences. The New Zealand police have said to us, and said this publicly, look, they say, alcohol is the biggest problem we have. There is evidence to suggest that most patrons entering clubs and bars late at night and early in the morning have consumed alcohol purchased from off licence before going, preloading, a big phenomenon in our nighttime culture. The supermarkets in New Zealand, of course, sell beer and they sell wine and they compete very vigorously and they discount aggressively. And the result of this is very cheap products. The question of irresponsible promotions, all you can drink for $30 or ladies free tonight or uh, half price for the next two hours, it seems to us that irresponsible promotions have to be caught by the Sale of Liquor Act and they have to be dealt with uh, by the Liquor Licensing Authority uh, and indeed uh, it seems to me they need the ability to flexibly act in that area as practice changes. One of the most remarkable things about this liquor industry is how it morphs and changes and develops to something new in front of your very eyes uh, in a year or two. New Zealand, the age is 18. There have been repeated attempts to change that to increase it. It was put to 18 in, in 1999. At the same time, beer went into supermarkets. So we are saying, look, the age needs to be increased. Our current proposal is on licences 20, at least on licences 18, off licences 20. Now that split age has secured quite a lot of support since we announced it. It is something in the nature of a compromise. It's very hard to put this particular genie back into the bottle. The district court judges said, look, when we've got repeat drunk drivers and we want to send them somewhere, there's nowhere to send them. 30 years ago, they were saying we need detoxification centres. We haven't got them. Residential care has been dealt, has, has gone away now. Uh, you know how all this community-based stuff swept uh, through everywhere and we did all that, it was cheaper. <laughs> well, we are really doing a very bad job on treatment and uh, our report says that. You could, by having specific objectives, do much better. Minimising crime and disorder promoting public safety, minimising public nuisance, protecting and improving public health, protecting families and children from harm, minimising harmful impact of liquor on state agencies such as police and the health service, um, encouraging responsible uh, uh, approaches to the promotion and sale and, uh, uh, and support of alcohol, to ensure that our, the alcohol industry develops and operates in a way that is consistent with the needs and aspirations of the community. The law is a blunt instrument. It can nudge, it can help, it can move, but it can't take the burden to the whole task. And if uh, 45 years as a lawyer has taught me anything, it is you have to be pretty humble about what you can achieve by legal change. Thank you.